Hey guys, welcome to Storytime Sunday. I'm recording this instead of doing it live um, because it's late and um, I, I figured if this didn't work out, well, then I could just do one tomorrow. This story is called The Only Way I Know. And it starts off um, with... Um, a little three-year-old girl, um, Paula Zuc Zucker. Paula had a very happy childhood, and out of nowhere, um, one day her par her parents, when she was uh, three years old, they were murdered. And before um, Paula's parents were murdered when she was three years old, um, they they taught her all about Jesus, but because she was so young, she had kind of forgotten all about that. But she went to live with her grandma, and living with her grandma, her grandma, taught her all about Jesus and showed, showed her how her father was a pastor, but he was not only a pastor, he, he was in a jazz band and um, his jazz band came out with a, a CD um, called um, called Conception, and every time people would listen to this CD, they would get pricked. Oh, the CD was called Consummation, and um, the CD was really popular. Every time a couple would listen to it, they would get pregnant, and also her father was so awesome. He communicated with everybody. He um, he was friends to the homeless person on the street. He was friends with gays and lesbians. He didn't he didn't agree with them, of course, but he was the most non-judgmental person ever. And his wife, um, her mother, was um, a lady of the night. And what happened before she became his wife? What happened was um, her father um, had married this really uptight woman. And... Um, he was in this really loveless marriage and um, what happened was because he was in this real, really loveless marriage um, he, he went he went to a place where he shouldn't have gone and did stuff he shouldn't have done and he create, created Paula with this uh, lady of the night and um, but he at the time they thought they would just make kind of an arrangement but through the years they really ended up falling in love with each other and she and she ended up giving her life to the Lord and having a really happy marriage with her husband. Um, one day an intruder came and shot them both and 
that was it. And um, there was a politician in the town that um, bought, um, started this pastoral um, adopting adopt program where where pastors could adopt children, not adopt children, but bring children without parents into their home to basically act as foster parent. So anyway, she was brought into this pastor home, pastor's home. Um, the pastor's name was Carlton Daly. He was a television pastor and he, he had a very small church, a very, um, a very, um, a church that wasn't really growing and he had lost his faith. Anyway, after, um, Paula's grandma died, she became a part of this, um, pastoral foster program where she would be adopted by um, a pastor and what what happened the um, pastor Camden no pastor Carlton who whom she was adopted by he had two sons and his two sons um, were teenagers and, and he was married but his marriage wasn't really good. Um, ever since Pastor Carlton was a little, ever since he got married he wanted a daughter, but but when only um, boys came, they said, okay, we've got boys and that's it. So anyway, when this, when Paula's grandmother died and she had no other family, he participated in this exchange program not exchange program in this pastoral foster program where where they would foster her for a few months and what happened was uh, when he, when the first night that he fostered her um th they were asking her oh Oh, what did your father do? Was he a deacon? Was he a... What did he do? Um, and he and she said, Oh, my father did what you did. And he, he said, Oh, your father was a pastor. And what did your mother do? What... Um, he said, Well, before my mother... Um, well, my mother was, did what Rahab did for most of her life, but at, at the end of it, she became a Christian and, uh, her, the, the pastor's wife was like, Carlton's wife was like, I, I don't like her. I don't like where she comes from. Her, her father was a pastor and her mother was a lady of the night. Uh, how, can, how can we help her? Um, and he, he's like, oh, what, what do you, um, so, um, in spite of the pastor's wife's misgivings about her because of her parentage. Um, they, 
they had brought her into their home and the church that they had was were was small and it was dying so basically um um when when one day when the pastor was coming up from the living room he heard someone singing and um and it was Paula singing something and playing something. He didn't, the pastor didn't know that she played and sang, but, um, and what had happened, this bonded him, this bonded him to her because he was also into music and just told so this formed up with them a bond but she was never quite able to to um bond with the pastor's wife as she um there was one time where the pastor was sick and with a cold and he couldn't preach he was like oh i need to preach the word there's no one else to preach the word and there was no other pastor uh to to preach um but they said but he was so sick um but he said the Lord said to him, don't worry, I've got it under control. So the pastor said, wait, let me rest and I will, and I will um, come later. I'll feel better, I'll rest. And then they had the worship and the prayer and all that stuff. When it came time for the sermon, um, Paula um, felt in her spirit that she should get up, which was weird because at this time, um, she, she was a teenager. And at this time, she had never spoken, never done anything. So, but when she got up, she just started to open the word of God and preached, preach, and people were so blessed by what she was preaching and what she was teaching that uh, she was so uh, blessed. Like, people were so blessed by what was happening. And, um, she okay and there was this one time when when uh she had gone there was this one time where there was a gang right and between these two gangs and um Paula and her father were 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 driving back from a youth meeting where where Paula was preaching because at that time she was preaching a lot because um, the Spirit of God was on her and she was really just into preaching a lot. What happened was um, was that Paula had to go to the bathroom and and although she was 16 the only place that was open was this seedy bar that this gang rivalry was taking place in and when she went into the went into the place to just use the bathroom these people were throwing punches 
and um, now she had watched a bunch of um, people playing pool. Um, she had watched a bunch of pool cue matches and all of that stuff. So she walks up to these big guys and say, says, hey, if you, if I win this game, he says, he says, I challenge you to a game of pool. And if you, if you win, you guys can keep on killing each other and none of us will stop you. But if I win, not only do you guys have to stop, but you guys have to come with me in lieu of money. That, that is only if you're not too chicken to, to lose against a 16 year old. And he, and the big guy said, we're not chicken. They think this is going to be easy and she, so she wins this pool game and these guys stop fighting and then the next day everybody's in the church because they want to see if these two big rival gangs who lost a pool game to a 15 year old to a 16 year old girl actually come and they do and they actually um they actually really get they get saved that next day and the church begins to really uh, get bigger and get bigger and get bigger um, and the thing about Paula too was when she saw um, anybody hurting anybody you know that needed comforting she knew the words to say and there was one time where where her class her 11th grade class visited a um visited a woman's shelter and she was talking to the to the women she just she just was ministering to them. Keep in mind, this is a public school. But, but as she began to minister the word of God, these women were crying and they're like, um, how do we get to know the Lord? And she just ministered to them. And it's like, and, and she began to talk to them about salvation and uh, what Jesus did for them on the cross. And she just began to minister to this to this group of women until they cried and cried and then they received the Lord as their Lord as their Lord and Savior. And the the two of them wanted the women all from this woman's shelter wanted to get baptized. So that night they had a baptismal service, not only for the women, but for anybody who wanted to get baptized. And anytime Paula would speak, the Lord would move and just uh, be so awesome. And he, and she revitalized the whole town years went by and she kept preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and uh, what happened was when she was about 21 years old she she traveled the country and when she was about 21 years old she went to a retreat and when she went to that 
when she came back from that youth retreat, she was a totally different person. And nobody could figure out why she was a totally different person. And then a few, about two months after that, about six weeks after that retreat, Paula, Paula started throwing up like, uh, like, she started feeling sick and throwing up and just being very nauseous and being very irritable and not smelling. Um, her sense of smell was off and when, when the pastor's wife was cooking, she couldn't stay in the kitchen because the smell of food would send her off and she had cravings for something. Anyway, she took a pregnancy test and it turned out that at 21 years of age, um, Paula was pregnant. Now, because of her mother's history and her daughter's, hi her father's history and how they met, um, people were saying, see, I knew she wasn't a good person. I knew she was a fraud. She was probably sleeping with our sons um, all the time. Uh, and the rumor went about town was that she had, she had got carried away with one of the, um, one of the youth on the youth retreat that she had gotten carried away, you know. But something didn't seem right to the pastor. Uh, he said, that doesn't seem like the person I know, the Paul I know loves Jesus, loves his word. Something is going on here. They asked her and she said, yeah, I got, I, I got away with myself and I committed sin with this um, bo boy that was um, there. And, um, but there was something very different about her. She didn't want to preach. She didn't want to speak to anyone. She didn't want to, you know, do anything and you and everybody thought it was because of the shame and guilt but inside he knew there was something going on there was something else going on and what happened was um the pastor used to babysit this youth boy um that was claiming to be the father of the child and you, you know when you babysit babies you have to change them and he had a moon birthmark on his bottom and the pastor just asked her what um like about the birthmark. The pastor got this idea to ask her about this birthmark because obviously if she was intimate with the guy like she said, she would have seen his birthmark. This birthmark on his bottom. Or sorry, no, on his chest, on his chest area. So the pastor asked her, you know, I used to babysit him when he was a little kid and he had this birthmark. So he, he had a, a little mark somewhere on his, on his skin. 
uh, did you see it? You said you were fully naked. He said, she said, yes, I saw it. And he said, what is it? Uh, and she said, oh, it's, it's a star. And she, he said, no, it's not a star. It's a moon. She's, he said, I know something is going on. You haven't been the same since you got back from your trip. You could say it's your, your pregnancy. You could say it's your shame. You can say it's your guilt. But I sense that something else is going on. What is going on? And And um, he says, she says, she breaks down with him and says, oh, and he, she tells him the truth, that it was the politician who instilled the program that raped her and got her pregnant. And he was so upset, this pastor, this person, because this person had raped his daughter and asked her to lie about it. And he was so upset. So he went to the police. They didn't believe him. He, he went to the, he went everywhere. They didn't believe him. And at every corner, um, when he thought he was getting somewhere with somebody, the politician would either pay them off or they would say that they couldn't help her. Like, no matter what he did, it was not working. And this was even driving a wedge through his marriage because um, his wife says oh the apple doesn't fall far from the tree her, her, her mother was a whore and now she is and he says I can't believe you're saying this this is our daughter she's like um, he's like this is our daughter how could you say this um, and she's like, she isn't our daughter. She's just a person that we brought into our house five, year, five years ago. And you seem to forget that. I only have two children, two sons. He's like, but he's like, I have two, but I have two sons and a daughter. If you don't want to acknowledge her, that's your business. But I'm going to stand by her. And, she, and he just, he just, he went for help everywhere that he could. The police, judges, but whatever he did, um, he was stopped so um, about two weeks later um, about two weeks about four weeks later um, there is there is no about about four weeks later, there's a headline in the paper that the politician is dead. And, and nobody knows who did it. Nobody can find the body. Um, but, um, About two weeks before that, text messages were found uh, 
on the pastor's phone to a woman suggested text messages and it le led people to believe that he just left his wife and just left his marriage um, and everybody was like oh I'm so sorry and this and that and then after that um, the politician um, was, was found dead uh, but the two incidents seem to be coincidental you couldn't conduct them so um, so after they found the, the politician's body they didn't find any blood on him they didn't find any fingerprints no gun no nothing um, and they found out after they did the autopsy that the that the pastor no that somebody had poisoned him but nobody could find out who had poisoned him there was no fingerprints no nothing anywhere and as far as the town knew um, the pastor had run off with uh, somebody from his uh, congregation so but his daughter knew that there was something going on there and um, so he she pressured his brother who was a sheriff in another district to tell her what was going on because she knew that he couldn't do it alone and after a long long drive and a lot of persuasion his brother told her that um, to go to this jail and whatever um, and his daughter was like why why did you do this for, for me why did you uh, commit murder don't you know that you're going to be in jail now for the rest of your life he's like yes I know that but I couldn't stand your nightmares every night you're being a after you told me what was going on uh, I couldn't stand you me being afraid of him and I couldn't stand knowing that he had done all this to you and I couldn't stand knowing that knowing that you couldn't sleep or that you were in harm and, and nobody would help me so so I got a lady to plant text messages on my phone to, to make it look like we were having an affair and planning to run off together uh, on the day well, well so I left and about two weeks after I left town I got in touch with a chemist that I knew from college and got him to uh, make a, a potion to to kill the politician without any um, without anybody being able to tell 
that it was me. Uh, so I got him to drink the potion and then after he was dead I brought his body to the police station and confessed to everything and said I will take any sentence I don't want a court hearing I don't want a trial I waive all all those rights I just want to serve my time in a jail out in an in another part of the country so that this won't touch my family. It's much easier to deal with my father had an affair than my father committed murder. So that's what I did. It was the only way I knew to prove that I was on your side, that I believed you. He said, she said, Daddy, why did you do that? She said, he said, well, I, I loved you and I knew you. And she said, well, Daddy, who's going to take care of the church now? We still have members. We still have church things to take care of. She's, he's like, well, you're 21. You could do it. He said, well, me, he, she said, what, me, who, me? And she said, and he said, yes, you, I believe you can do it. And she cried and said, nobody has believed in me this much. What are you going to do? He's like, don't worry, baby girl, I'm going to serve my sentence and then... I'm going to still keep keep watching up for you and getting updates on you and don't worry you can do this. So and he, she said the, he said the only deal I want is you tell nobody that you saw me, you tell nobody that I'm in here serving time. As far as they know I've run off with some woman and she's and she hugs her daddy tight and she says I'll do you proud and 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 she says okay and he and she and he says you better I hope you enjoy my story See you next week for Storytime Sunday 25. Thanks.